We would like to thank LSR for sponsoring the Let's Be Frank video podcast. LSR produces Southern Cane Pure Cane Sugar, which is only grown, refined, and packaged in Louisiana. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rouse's supermarkets. We're kicking off episode number 12 on the Let's Be Frank video podcast. I am your host, Jason Duet. Alongside me is Hall of Fame head coach, Frank Monica. We got a great show for you tonight. We're going to talk some LHSAA playoffs, look at round one and some upsets that occurred. We're going to preview some round two matchups. We're going to look at some local college football talk, LSU, Tulane. We also have a big matchup between Southeastern and Nichols. We're going to talk some Saints football. We have special guest, state championship football coach, Lou Valden. And in the Let's Be Frank segment, coaches are going to talk about what happens after 105 scholarships. So we'll go ahead and bring on Coach Monica. Coach, uh, great night to have a podcast. The weather's turning a little bit colder. Football weather is kind of sitting in. But i got to ask, when you look at these brackets, we know that everybody's eyes are going to kind of go to Division One Select because of the amount of – it's not top-heavy. One to the bottom, anybody can kind of beat anybody on any given night. But what's a, what other division really has piqued your interest other than Division One Select? Well, I, I think, you know, when you look at it, I think that probably Division Division One – uh, the big guys in non-select, I think they have a lot of good teams at the top of that one. Uh, and even the Class A, even the Division Select of Division Four, uh, there, there's several. There might be eight teams in there that could actually win this thing on that level and uh, on the select side, the Division Four. So we'll, we'll touch it briefly on, the, on those guys, but basically you hit it on the head. I mean, that, that D1 Select group is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, and now I don't know if people realize it, but you're home all the way through the playoffs. If, so if you which which is pretty tough. I mean, it's I guess you earned it. But I think that something needs to be revisited on that because uh, you have the home field advantage all the way through the playoffs. If you D one guy all the way to the Superdome. So only time you won't be playing at home is in the Superdome if you continue to win. Coach, I think you're spot on with that. I think Division Four Select is sneaky scary, uh, the amount of teams that they have, and we're going to touch on those in just a moment. But before we do that, let's go ahead and jump into prep talk, and we're going to go ahead and recap some of the big wins or upsets that we saw in round one. Coach, what did you see in round one that kind of jumped out at you? Well, the, the, number one was 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 Hannon and St. Michael's. Hannon defeated St. Michael's in the close ball game. Uh, that's the 22 seed versus 11. And uh, Hannon had one win going into the season, so that's a huge, huge win for them. Uh, you got to be proud of them because they, they fought there. St. Michael's 11 seed, and probably thinking you know, you go in the playoffs. I mean, listen, everything rolls back to zero zero, and it's sometimes it's hard to motivate kids uh, after you after you get that far in, and and uh, no, te- no matter what you tell them, they read the paper, they listen to to parents, they listen to students, they listen to the media, and there's no such thing as a gimme. So you know, that, that happened. And, you know, aside from that, you, you had the next one, you had walking touchdown, exact same scenario. The difference is this, this game was flipped from the, from the previous time they played. These teams played one another before. Walker was a 22 seed and 11. And the, but the, those coaches know what they're doing. You get in the 5A level, you're going to have large coaching staffs and those guys know what they're doing and uh, they don't want to go home early. And uh, so, uh, that's a big deal. And I think the mantra that week is coaches tell their players that you want to go to basketball or you want to be packing your gear next week or you want to go on and continue to play. And the excitement of being in the playoffs is nothing like that in the high school level. Everybody gets in. All of a sudden, they're more, there's more uh, energy. Um, you can see it in the student body. There are signs all over the hallways. There are signs in the yards. And I said that because, you know, the, you, it's a sudden death playoff. So the, the interest level is, is there. Uh, the next one we had, we had Port Allen, which is the number 23 seed. They beat the number 10 seed, Church Point, uh, who's a good football team. And, and Port Allen was a mediocre, had a mediocre season. Didn't even actually have a winning record, but they would defeat per, uh, Church Point. So that was a that was a surprise in it in itself. And uh, I'm sure that Church Point didn't see that coming, even though they were a the home team. And all these higher seeds were the home team. Now, this was not a big upset. But uh, because it was a previous meeting, John Curtis and Brother Morton, but it was a 19 seed versus the 14 seed. Brother Morton, a fine, fine program. Uh, but now they're sitting home because they ran up against, a, as we talked about earlier, 
one of those tremendous matchups that they had before. Uh, John Curtis won the first meeting in that very, very close contest, and, and they won this one too. So, you know, um, that's going to happen. One team we, you and I didn't talk about, Jason, that it was, was an upset. I thought it was an upset. Chalmette defeating Terrebonne. Terrebonne was, was a higher seed, but not by much. But, but uh, uh, Terrebonne has actually shown that they can win a lot of football games because they were one team that actually beaten Def Jam during the year. So we thought that to be a, a, a mild upset. And coach, when you look, they also had Evangel defeating Captain Shreve in, in their rematch of a game that was uh, talked about around the country because Evangel's quarterback threw for over 800 yards and they still dropped the game in overtime. So a, a tale of a lot of rematches in some of these upsets as well. And we've talked about this before, how sometimes you'll see the opposite and the, you know, the opposite results from what you saw in the regular season. And whether that's just getting difficulty around your players mentally, understanding that this team is a threat despite the fact that you played them before, whatever the reason may be. Jason, I remember, and I forget the year, uh, when I was coaching, it was at, we were at St. Charles Catholic, and we had, we had defeated Lutcher during the season. And it was a comfortable score. And um, and we, all of a sudden, we thought, we really thought that we were going to be playing another team. And in fact, one of the, the statisticians told us, oh, no, you'll be playing another team. So we rode home thinking that we we're going to play, I'll never forget it, Chalmette. And then all of a sudden, the the guy said, wait a minute now, Chalmette got beat. Lutcher scored the last play of the game to beat Chalmette, so we have to play Lutcher again. And all of a sudden, and I'd already announced to the kids that we were going to play Chalmette. So I guess Monday's practice was the dullest practice we've ever had. I mean, we were yelling and screaming to try to get them going. Tuesday's practice is exactly the same thing because they were thinking the same result. Wednesday's practice was no better, but guess what? We ended up getting beat on that Friday. And because, you know, I've always believed that what you see on Monday and Tuesday, you're going to see on Friday night. And what I saw on Monday and Tuesday was a flat football team. And I hate to use that word, but we were unemotional because of the rematch. And, you know, they listen to things, they read into things, and, and they, they, we just took them lightly. And that team went on to win the state championship. So but you, you never know. And so it's something that is a lesson there. Let's go ahead and look at some of these round two matchups. There's so many to look at, but we're going to go ahead and – Go from division to division. Let's go ahead and start in Division One, non-select. Some really good matchups there, Coach. What are some ones that stand out to you? Well, I think the Covington Neville game is, is, looks like a pretty good one. Uh, I think Neville and Covington two fine programs. Neville's been in the Superdome many times. Covington having a fine year. Have a good quarterback. Uh, they've they've stubbed stub, stub their toe against two real fine teams, Mandeville and St. Paul. But this could be an interesting game and. And I don't know if Neville's what they used to be, but this could be an interesting game. Uh, also, in Division One, you have St. Aug and St. Thomas More. I mean, that's a very interesting game. Now, St. Aug has to go on the road. And that's, that in itself, like again, like Covington has to go on the road, St. Aug has to go on the road. But St. Aug is getting better. They're very, very explosive. Uh, STM runs a high-paced offense, which means that they, they snap the ball within every 14 seconds. And this could be a, this could be a high-scoring affair. I don't see anybody really shutting them down. Uh, Rumble McDonough, 35. McDonough, 35, put up a lot of points against Riverdale last week. They have a receiver that's going to LSU that's that's uh, really, really good and fast. Uh, Rumble had a bye week, and you'll sometimes bye weeks come back to haunt you. But um, I think you know, Coach Monica knows that he's, he's concerned about Mac 35. He knows that how explosive they are. And uh, so I think that could be a good matchup. Uh, D1. Acadiana and John Curtis. The John Curtis has to go on the road. What a matchup! Two Veer teams. I mean that 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 game could be over by by seven thirty. You know, two Veer teams running a hard dive, running at one another, uh, similar schemes. And I think Acadiana might throw the ball just a little bit more than than Curtis does. Uh, but that's going that's quite a matchup. What we think in, in itself, and there will be a lot of bumps and bruises after that ball game. Uh, I think I I ran over Rustin and Zachary. Rustin and Zachary, Zachary's have always there. At the end, they were, they were in the, the, the state championship game recently. And so Rustin is a good program, a real big physical football team. That's going to be a big, big matchup. Uh, there are so many of them. Evangel and, and Alexandria, again, this could be a track meet. I mean, this could be a, a basketball score that you can see, like you saw last week with, with the uh, Evangel also. Uh, so this could be a real, real I think a high scoring affair, and it will be. It will be very interesting. That's what fans really want to see. I think 
I think a lot about a lot of people talk about that uh, in the other division. I'm taking Division Two, for instance, uh, Division Two in the public school side, or uh, we should say non-select. Jennings and Opelousas, two fine football programs, and this this could be a great one. Opelousas, defending state champion, they have, they they have a couple losses, but their losses have been to real real good opponents. So that could be a that could be a uh, uh, just a phenomenal game. It'd be a battle in the trenches. Uh, two fine programs, good coaching. And then Lutcher, Lutcher and Cecilia. Coach, uh, I know Coach Jenkins, I spoke with him today. He wasn't crazy about this draw at all. It was all impacted. A lot of these matches were, were impacted because of the UI situation where UI was, had to fall for their, their ball game. But, but uh, the advantage here is that Lutcher will be uh, home playing against a, a real refined Cecilia team. Another D2 but this is on the select side. It will be St. Charles Catholic, SCC playing Madison Prep. Madison Prep with a huge win against University High. Don't know how impacted University High was because of the ruling, but uh, Madison Prep has a lot of people, uh, a lot of big linemen on this side of the ball, they're explosive. Uh, but St. Charles Catholic, is, they're, they're battle-tested from the schedule that they've played. Coach Stein and his staff, I'm sure, will, will work their buns off, and uh, they, they, they will play complimentary football, and they look. They live for the for the playoffs, and I think that's one thing a lot of these teams do. Uh, they just can't wait to get to the playoffs. Uh, another team that that we look to see. I, I've overlooked them. Jesuit and Turlins in the D one in the select side. Jesuit is going to go to Turlins. A lot of these people are traveling. Most of the Catholic leagues seem to be traveling because um, and this is going to be a good ball game. Turlins got a big offensive line. They score a lot of points, but Jesuit very physical. Jesuit has got a real good D line. I'd look for this to be a low scoring game because I don't think Turlin's going to score a lot of points on Jesuit. And, and Jesuit's capable too. They got a quarterback that can throw the deep ball, and uh, they're very capable, and they got a good running back. So um, hold on to your hat that, that they, they got to like that draw at, at this particular time. Um, I'm going down just a little bit to, to um, the other division, Division II. Uh, I This is public school side. I keep calling them public, but they're non select. You got Iota and Lakeshore. Lakeshore, Lakeshore is very, very explosive. Iota is the number eight seed. Lakeshore, I think it is a, probably they have to they have to travel, but but it'll be hard to defend. Uh, when somebody doesn't play a team like Lakeshore, they run a version, they, they run a, a version, a hybrid of the wing tee, and they run some other stuff with it. They still run the, the speed and the stretch and stuff like that, and uh, with the wing tee. So Coach Indes is gonna, you know, he. He'll, he'll surprise a lot of people in the playoffs. They'll be well coached in terms of that. So this could be a higher scoring game. On the, the, the St. James and Downsville, a non-select team, the same divisions, St. James and Downsville, St. James, the number one seed. Downsville, I don't look for Downsville to really read them, but you never know if St. James doesn't play because this is a backyard rivalry. They, these, they're only 15 miles apart. And uh, this is a rematch of a previous game. Uh, so don't sell Downsville short. They're young, but they got a little talent on that team. But unfortunately, I think St. James got a little bit better. The quarterback, just being a ninth grader, is getting better on a weekly basis. On on the D3 seat side, I see LCA and Notre Dame in the rematch. Uh, LCA, and they're going to play. Notre Dame is the home team here. They'll be playing at the Crowley Stadium. And uh, this is a rematch of the previous game where Notre Dame won that game. Uh, LCA has gotten better as the season goes on. And they're also battle-tested because they've played some 5A opponents all the way through this thing. Remember, they used to be in a 4A school, and they just they declined and they decided this time to go slide back down to play in the enrollment. So that could be a real, real good matchup also. Uh, D3 again, Calvary and De La Salle. Calvary Baptist and De La Salle. De La Salle, again, most of the teams are traveling from the city this, this week. And um, uh, De La Salle, I think, is a I think that they could be a nightmare draw because I, I really think that they got the people. Coach Graham knows how to get in the playoffs. He's, you know, he's got some skins on the wall. He's coached in a, in a state championship game before, but Calvary is very, very explosive. They have a real, real good back that they, that he's a D, D1 guy. He's a big, big time recruit. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see. I think Dillis South can control the line of scrimmage. If, if Dillis South should win this game, it's going to have to be a low scoring game. Uh, I haven't D3 also. I have Newman. And the Arbonne Woods. I don't look for this to be a, a, a real uh, tough game uh, for Newman. I think that that comes next week if Newman lines up possibly against Catholic of New Iberia. But uh, you never know in the playoffs. And I think you know Coach Stewart is 
Very, very confident about his football team. His quarterback is having a phenomenal year. I think his team is rested and fresh, and I th- definitely think that his, his team is anxious to get back in, on the field and play a, a football game and, and get this the playoff thing going. I think they feel like they have a chance to go, go to the Superdome. Uh, other than that, we have on the uh, Division Four level, and this is select side, Riverside and Hamilton Christian. This is a relatively new school out of Lake Charles. Uh, Riverside, I, I think, has, has a lot, a lot of skill. Uh, Coach Roussel will have this team prepared in, in the playoffs. And the, but the, the bottom line is Hamilton Christian, which we don't know much about them. So you, you never know. It, you know, you have an off night or something like that. But, but I think they're looking, Riverside is, they're looking at ahead of them. They're in the tough side of the bracket for the future. And, and lastly, I have on the list the matchup, St. Martins and St. Edmunds. Now, I know St. Martins got the great back, but St. Edmunds have been a, a team that's been there before. They've been in the playoffs. They've been a perennial, uh, you know, contender for the state championship uh, in, from Eunice, and, and uh, they play a good, good brand of football. I really don't know uh, if St. Martins have the linemen, but, uh, you know, so Barry's going to have to kind of take the game over himself, and he's going to have to score two, three touchdowns himself. But um, but uh, look for this to be a real, real good football game. So basically, and, and oh, we have one right down on the river, Magnum and West St. John. Uh, kudos to West St. John for having a phenomenal year. Very still a very very young football team, but you look at their bracket; they could actually make some. They could buy Magnum. They can actually make some noise in their bracket and find themselves in the semifinal ball game. So basically, that's what you have on the high school level. Uh, with some now naturally, there's more games than this, but uh, we probably will get some surprises as you always do. Uh, but I think for the most part, a lot of these teams will hold true to form. Yeah, a lot of great matchups and some that we can even look forward to. But again, we'll have to wait and see what this week, how this week plays out, and how you know the the circular motion of this playoff will go. You know, uh, we'll, we'll see some teams that have to replay some matchups and get some upsets. That's the beauty of high school football. You know, with the way that the college game has been with the bowl games and their select matchups that you have to play, and there's no opportunity for, as you've mentioned, coach, uh, due to some pushback from coaches in the past, not having that opportunity to play through a bracket and play some of those smaller teams. That's one beautiful thing about high school football. There's never been that issue. Uh, on any given night, any team can play anybody and beat them. And I think that's the great thing about high school football. There's never been that issue in place. Exactly. Let's go ahead and shift as we're going to go ahead and take a look at some local college football. And we're going to start out with LSU as they dropped their game to Florida 27 to 16. And it was just an ugly football game, coach. We've kind of been saying this the past few weeks. This is LSU's third loss in a row. Uh, we've kind of gone back and forth on what, what maybe have been some issues or some apparent needs for LSU. I think the offense has kind of been exposed completely. And you said it many times that you know winning can mask deficiencies, that by winning ball games you might ignore some of the things that you might not otherwise. I think the LSU offense has looked pretty sloppy during the old miss game from that point forward. They haven't played crisp. I think the defense has kind of been uh, stepping up in moments and giving them an opportunity, but – Again, I, I just don't think that this LSU offense is where they need to be at this point in the season, and they're going to have to improve moving forward because you have a Vanderbilt team coming in next week or this week that's going to be a tough team to beat. I think uh, the bottom line is that the offense, I understand. Offense wins games, defense is prevention from losing. you got to remember this. We said at the beginning, I don't think LSU's defense has the personnel. I'll say it again. They just don't. I don't think they have a, an All-American type team, an All-SEC type guy on the defensive side of the ball. Um, maybe Weeks might get there. Swinson is up and down, stuff like that. Uh, they gave up even. I uh, can't believe this ball game they just lost. They At the time of possession, 41 minutes, they had the ball They had the ball almost twice as long. Now, time of possession, remember I said this, is not an indicator that you won the game. It's not an indicator at all. But they had the ball so many times. They had so many more snaps, doubled up Florida in the snap. But they gave up, also gave up. Seven plays that were over 15 yards or better. That's too much for a defense. That's too much for a defense to give up. They're not very good on special teams to make that up. So really, uh, what's their best phase of the ball game? They can't play complimentary football. They're not good enough on defense. They don't play. They're not on short field. But yet I say that they crossed the 50-yard line five times, and the LSU did. 
and they, they certainly didn't score in those times. And uh, again, a lot of the fault they, they said is on the offensive line and stuff like that. They just don't have the game breakers. They don't have a great back. They don't have great receivers. They got average receivers. And uh, so, I mean, the bottom line that they can't pan it. I, 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 they're still pretty good. But listen, we said from the beginning, I thought that LSU would probably lose this many games from the beginning of the year. I didn't think they had a team that's going to be a playoff team. Uh, they just don't have the personnel. I think Coach Kelly does a great job. I know a lot of people won this case, but I think he's, he's doing a great job with what he had. Remember, people forgot. He inherited a program that had 39 scholarship guys when he took over. 39 scholarship guys. He had to build that whole roster of coming from that. And they didn't go through the transfer portal too much. You know, he tried to build it with young kids. And some of the guys left with the, for the NFL, some of the guys opted out uh, to transfer. So, I mean, you know, he was left. He, he really didn't have that much talent coming back. Where is the talent on that team? Somebody tell me that they got great players. I know the LSU players don't want to hear that, but um, they're just not. They're just not too deep. That the, the the defensive line, or the, the two interior guys, you don't even hear the name called. They make very very few plays. The secondary is very very average. It's not their fault. It's Coach Kelly or the staff. I just and and I know he's taking a lot of heat for that. And uh, but they can't hit the panic button. I hope that that, that there's more to come. All right, Coach, and this week they played Vanderbilt at home. They're breaking out some gold uniforms. I, I guess they're trying to emulate Oregon. If you can't win a title, pull out as many uniforms as you can. Uh, I think they're going to have trouble against this rushing attack of Vanderbilt. I, I know what they've been able to do throughout the season. They were able to beat Alabama due to the way that they are able to attack a defense. I think this, this Vanderbilt offense has potential – to give a defense, as you mentioned, is maybe a bit undermanned, a lot of trouble. And quarter, their quarterback is excellent. I mean, he's the same type of guy. He's a runner, and uh, he can actually throw the ball a little bit. And and they, look, they've beaten they've beaten Alabama, though, so they they know how to win. I mean, um, I think they have three losses in the SEC, and uh, but I think I think this could be a closer game because you know the odds maker think that, think that LSU they gave LSU. Um, at the minus, I think LSU right now is what minus 10. Nine. I think it was like around yeah. nine or yeah. 10. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that, that's a lot of points to give a team that's kind of struggling, coach. I think that's points afforded to a team with a brand name. I, I, I really I think that's Vegas betting on the fact that people are going to look at LSU as the brand name and bet them. I, mm -hmm. I think that line is really skewed. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and take a look at Tulane, who's really done an excellent job. We talked about this, coach. You get a thirty-five to nothing win over Navy. This is a Navy team that was in the conversation for making the playoffs a few weeks ago, and for you to beat a team that tends to operate on the ground and to beat them thirty-five to nothing the way that Tulane has, it proves that the conversation needs to open up a bit. To we know that Boise has this all-American-esque running back, and and he has all this ability, and, and is the Heisman conversation. But at what point do we look at the schedule and say, hmm? Tulane played two really good teams. We might have to give them a little bit more credit than what we've been doing. Well, two things that you got to remember: Tulane was playing really good football in the first quarter. The second part of the second quarter, they hurt Harvath, the Navy quarterback, uh, when Grubbs tackled him on the sideline and hurt him. He tried to come back in for one series. He wasn't the same guy because he's the guy that's a runner and he's a thrower. And when he went to the second team guy, he was completely out of sort. They had a lot of false starts with him. He couldn't throw the ball. So it played into Tulane's hands, and 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 their defense, Tulane defense, got got after there, and then I don't know if they made the eight first downs in the whole game after that. And Tulane's offense, Meza, for the first time, actually ran the ball a little bit. He actually scored a touchdown on a long run on a scramble throw, and they've been waiting for him. They said because I think prior to that time, he only had like less than ten carries uh, going into that ball game. But that was a big, big win for them to go on the road. And it's the first time I think they had lost on senior on senior day, uh, and it's a big lot of you know fanfare. The F-16s fly over, and uh, the, the all the midshipmen are out there. I mean, in their uniform, and it was a packed house. Now the stadium only holds right around forty thousand, but it, it was a packed house, and they were excited. But it, it just didn't unfold. And give Tulane and Coach Summer a lot of credit for getting his team prepared. Now, Coach goes looks at Memphis and. This is a scary team. This is a 92 football team and uh, that they play on Thanksgiving night. And uh, so thank God that they do have a weekend off here, but they have to play a really scary Memphis team. Everybody's talking about Tulane has earned a trip to the, the conference championship bowl against Army already. 
that's already been solidified. But uh, Memphis is a scary team. They have a lot of transfer portal guys and uh, real good receivers, and they can score a lot of points. So if Tulane doesn't play hard or play well, I think uh, Coach Sumro, I think he does the best job of keeping his guys grounded, though. I think he, you know, he calls a spade a spade and say, hey, listen, guys, this is the story. So you better listen to me. And uh, in terms of what we're saying right here, or else we'll get ourselves thumped and uh, get, get your eyes off the, the conference championship game. Uh, what is odd, uh, Jason, that people don't realize, Army, uh, Army has, has two more ball games to play. They have two more ball games, and they play Notre Dame this week. Then they play Texas San Antonio the following, and then they have the, the Navy game. So they have three games left to play, and uh, chances of them are making making the, the playoffs, uh, I think, are pretty slim. And I think um, personnel-wise, I think uh, Tulane will be better. But I think it's important that Tulane gets by Memphis this week. All right, Coach, and I think you're absolutely right that you, when you do look at them trying to push for a playoff bid, you can't look ahead against the Memphis team. You do, you did, again, third straight time that they made it to a conference title, and that's a, a massive achievement, especially considering that they were under a new coach and a new direction this season. So, again, Tulane continues to build their brand and, and make their presence known in Louisiana. And when you look at our next game, we had Lamar defeating Nickel State 24-7, to uh, a tough loss for them, but they're going to have to turn their head around quick because we know that that massive in-state robbery against Southeastern is coming up this week. And no question. I was a little surprised at the score that Nickel State only scored seven points, uh, uh, Jason, in this ball game. And uh, But playing on the road is awfully tough in any conference. Uh, I don't care, the SEC, Big Ten, you play on the road, it's pretty tough. And, and uh, you know, because in Nickel's case, and, and, and the FCS teams, they have to basically travel. Most of the time, they travel by bus, and that's hard to travel by bus. It's long bus rides and stuff like that. Uh, if, the, if the trip is far enough away, then they'll, they'll travel by plane. But that's a, that's a, a tough on, on these athletes. Plus, they have to turn around and play Southeastern. That's been rested, and Southeastern has six wins. Southeastern resurrected their, te- their season. They were 0-3 at the beginning of the year, and, and they've come along. They've, they've won six games now, and uh, so this could be an interesting game, and actually – um, in conference, they only have one loss in conference. And so this is a big game for, for Southeastern. But Nickel State, uh, you know, I think last year Nickel State won this ball game. It's going to be held in Thibodeau on Thursday night. So it'll be very interesting. That, and I hope to be in attendance And because I, I have some former players on, on both sides of the ball. So I hope to be in attendance to, to watch this ball game, to watch the Coach Rebo and Coach Selfo go at it. Always a fun uh, matchup within the state. And we love to see some of these bigger FCS matchups. But we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to some Saints football as the Saints came out on top, 35-14 to 14, against the Browns. And that's yet another win after moving away from Coach Dennis Allen and kind of looking forward to the future. Do you think that we could continue to see the success from this team? I, th- I think you're he's, he's still going to see them play hard. Now, whether they're good enough to win, win more ball games, I don't know. Uh, the schedule right now, they've got the, 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 the Rams coming up and next week, not this week. They have the open week, and I think the open week comes at a good time. It's a late open week. Uh, Coach Riz, Renzi is doing a phenomenal job. I really like his motivation. Uh, there's something that Coach Kubiak changed. He really implemented a bunch of Jason, Taysom Hill stuff. He had him throw a couple passes off a reverse. He had him catch a couple balls, and even though he fumbled one time in, uh, inside the, the 10-yard line. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But but uh, he used him. And this is going to set the difference. I really think I'd love to see them continue and expand on this. He ran the zone read. Now, remember, that a lot of guys in the NFL can't do that because, one, he's an ex-quarterback and he's an ex-running back. So he can run the football, run the zone read, and if need be, he can throw from there because he's actually a good thrower too, because that was his natural position coming out of college. So uh, the, the, the zone read, the way he runs, I mean, he runs a 75 yard, but they're trying to just kill the clock. All he wants is the first down. All of a sudden, before you know it, he's got the edge and he outruns everybody. But if they expand on that, he could be really, really good. Plus he runs that power play. So he's not a true wildcat. He's a guy that's very versatile. He's a McCaffrey type guy that can pass. You know, McCaffrey can't pass. So if, if they use him as they did the other day, I don't care if he doesn't catch any more pass, but the fact that what he can do with the zone read that nobody else in the NFL can do because of him. And uh, I think that's something that they really need to expand on because that's hard to defend that stuff. And because there's one less guy that they block, and if he gets to the perimeter, 
he's a low 235 pound guy that they get on the ground so and he can hit, throw the rpos off of it so i can see them really really kind of putting a bunch of things that will help him do that i saw some things the other day though i saw a number of different types of screens that coach kubiak put in uh, i saw a couple wrinkles i saw inside screen i not see them run that before a very very effective play and uh, and and their defense seemed to be energized. They bend in a little bit, uh, but not breaking. So, uh, but even though Jameis Winston, the ex quarterback, had a phenomenal day against him, threw for almost 400 yards at 395 and throwing the deep ball. So, didn't like that. And I think Coach Renzi said that he gave up too many explosive plays. And um, that will get you beat in the close ball game. All right, that'll do it for our first segment. And when we come back from the break, we're going to have special guest Lou Valden joining us. Remember, watching on varsity sports now we would like to thank the accardo law firm for being a supporter of the let's be frank video podcast based out of gramercy louisiana lsr produces southern cane pure cane sugar which is only grown refined and packaged in louisiana lsr utilizes the latest innovations in technology as well as ensuring the growth and stability of Louisiana sugarcane farmers by integrating more than 800 growers in the industry's economic structure. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rouse's supermarkets. Since 1972, Riverlands Insurance Services has been dedicated to securing the best insurance products and services available to protect you, your family, your assets, and your business. Our goal has been to establish a strong relationship and partnership between you, the insurance company, and our agency, creating a circle of success that prepares for disasters before they actually happen. Welcome in our special guest who coached at Hondo High School as well as some others, but went at high school, coached for 15 seasons, won 132 games, and won a state title in an undefeated season in 2003. We want to welcome in our special guest, Lou Valden. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. And what inspired you to go into coaching and uh, to have all the success that you've had and to go to as many programs as you've been able to go to? Well, I was, uh, I got out of college in 1979. And I was, I was going to go to Jefferson Parish, and they were going on strike. <laughs> so I'm a Shaw graduate. So the principal at Shaw called me and offered me a job, said, we don't have any coaching openings or anything. I said, that's okay. And then so um, in the meantime, I'm sitting there in the faculty lounge, and Joe Zimmerman, the head football coach, says, hey, do you want to help with the freshman team? I said, yeah, okay. He said, well, I can't pay you anything. I said, well, I don't know anything. <laughs> I said, hey, can I have a T-shirt and a hat? And he said, yeah, okay. So that got me into coaching. And, um, you know, it, it changed my life. It's a, coach, thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, you've, you've, been, you've been a lifeline coach with a lot of, a lot of wisdom. And uh, you and I go back a long time, competed against one another stuff. And yeah, I think you, you, your expertise basically has been on the defensive side of the ball. Coach. Yes. What, what, have, what do you see has been different as far as defensive schemes and things that when you first started coaching? Coaching defense now is boring. <laughs> I mean, everyone runs the same thing. They're in the shotgun, inside zone, outside zone, counting power. You know, all PO. You know, when I first got into coaching, we had to defend a multiple offense. Like you ran at, at Jesuit. We had to defend a wishbone. We had to defend a wing T. We had to defend a split back via. It was, you know. Triple option. And, Triple yeah, option. and it made you a lot better coach having to defend those things. You know, I'm the only guy 
I might be the only defensive guy in the world the last few years in the Catholic League that was like actually looking forward to defending Curtis just because it was different. That, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense, Coach. And I, you know, I talk about this on this show all the time about how it, like wing wing T teams right now, a real good wing T team would be hard to stop because especially if they ran it well, because people don't see it very often, you know. Yeah, like Lakeshore. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think and as you can attest to this, because of the the, uh, the the schemes on offense, the defense's personnel have gotten faster. They've put more kind of gazelle type guys out on the field that can run and handle the bubbles and the screens and things of that nature. Don't you agree with that? Yeah, a lot of and what you see a lot of is a head up nose and two four eyes playing technique, which is that's hard to do. You know, a defensive tackle on the inside of a, a big tight end, that's hard to do. But that seems to be the flavor of, the, uh, you know, this season playing um, three down linemen and then just sending guys off the edge. Yeah. And and, and a lot of people do it different ways and coverages and things of that nature. And, um, you know, there are a lot of coaches out there that people don't realize whatever the colleges do, it shifts down to the high school and even from the pros. So, I mean, you know, you're not going to outcoach anybody anymore because they're there's so many clinics you can go to and information out there. Coach, uh, uh, you know, we talked about this briefly the other day when you and I went on the phone about the injury situation that's taking place in, in sports and, and um, you know, how it's now you don't see many guys, the starting 22 players don't seem to finish, and especially more in the, in the NFL ranks and college ranks than high school. But even in high school, you kind of see that uh, uh, medically they have to really, really jump, the, and the medical profession is jumping through hoops too because they have to be correct because of liability involved. But what's your take on that? Well, uh, when I, I got out of coaching, the Saints called and said, do you want to work for um, be our guy for USA football? And they said, you know, we'll give you a bunch of Saints stuff and you get paid. I said, okay, that's cool. So they sent me to Indianapolis and I got, you know, trained in the concussions and all that stuff. And so when I would give the clinic, the first thing I would ask these coaches is, how many of y'all had your bell rung? And about half of them raised their hands. And I said, how many of y'all went back in? And they all had their hands up. So that's one of the things right off the bat is, you know, concussion awareness. But um, fortunately, you don't have a lot of season ending injuries like you used. I remember a knee injury used to be like just that it was over. You know, and, well, we talk about that all the time, Coach. When we were, when I was playing, it was called water on the knee. And if your knee was puffed up, you go have it aspirated, and you can bend it again, and you play. But you played. I mean, I don't know. You don't hear that term anymore, water on the knee. You know, so uh, i got to tell you this. I think I went to the same forum that you went to in Canton, Ohio, and I was sent there by the, by the, by the Saints themselves. And I asked a question to this neurologist from Princeton University. And I asked the question in front of 400 people, and I said, can you tell me what's the difference between the symptoms, the difference between a concussion and heat exhaustion? And know what he said? He said that the symptoms are very, very similar. You just have extensive, extensive research on it. And he said to determine the difference. He said, but they're very similar. So a lot of times we mistake a concussion that we really, because of heat exhaustion. You know, so uh, that was that's something I had to throw out. Coach, you, you've seen a lot of players in the area. I'm jumping around on you. You've seen a lot of players in the area. Who's some of the more notable players that you think that we'll probably see playing on Saturday or Sunday? Um, I think the running back at Shaw, he's going to be a Sunday player. I agree. Definitely. He's agree. real good. He reminds me of the one I had, Alfred Blue. He's tall. He runs low to the ground, but he's better. Than Alfred Blue because he has really good change of direction. Um, I think he's really good. Uh, unfortunate that the Shepherd kid got hurt because I thought he was special also. Yeah, I had a chance to see him on tape only. I didn't see him live, but I saw the kid from Shaw live, and I agree with you totally. I mean, he he can take over a game in a heartbeat, and he dances around. He breaks down well in the runs. He's got great vision. And in terms of that, if anything, he kind of breaks down too much and chops his feet a little bit too much. But but when he gets going, he can he can really go. Coach, um, the 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 ruling today, as you probably heard by now, well, yesterday really came out that new highs out. Where do you see where do you see the the LHS position on this? I really agree with it that with what happened because it didn't look like U High really took care of business. I hate to see that for the U High players. 
but but they really impacted the rest because that that really even though they were given the, the wins back of the people that did beat them it still impacted their draw yeah absolutely i mean that's the one bad thing about the power rating system is that um now i think it's great and i think we do it right in louisiana um with the power rating but you know somebody you know breaks the rules and and everyone they play ends up paying uh, coach on the agenda in january the transfer portal in high school is being is going to be voted on now it's a one-time thing but in high school in louisiana uh what's your take on on do you think that will pass or what's your take on it i don't think it'll pass um you know uh if it passes it's because there's not enough traditional public schools left in Louisiana to get it passed. I mean, to, to shut it down. You know, there's so many public schools now on the select side. You got the private schools, uh, the traditional public school where if you live on the uh, West Bank of St. Charles Parish, you go to Hornville. That's it. You, you know, where you have a attended zone and that's where you go to school. Those schools are dying out. And so I don't know. I think those guys would definitely prefer not to have that. Right. I, I, I'm hearing a little bit about it. I talked to a coach the other day and he's not for it, but it's, I think, I think it's being pushed by the executive committee a little bit. So we'll find out uh, what, one way or the other coach, you know, I had a good friend of mine. In fact, uh, I won't bring up his name. He might not want me to mention this, but he had a real good idea. When we talk about the split select and non-select, he said it, they should change that name because the connotation of being select and non-select is not very good. It should be from traditional to non-traditional. And what he means by that, a traditional school, for instance, Hornville and Destrian were traditional, they're community schools. You know, the schools that are not traditional community schools like Lutcher, Hornville, Destrian, East St. John, that's traditional public schools. And that's and a non-traditional, anybody else that doesn't fall in that particular category should be non-traditional. That would take the sting out of this this thing a little bit because let's face it the championships we have right now are really basically watered down you saw last week we actually listed we might have had maybe four upsets last week they weren't great upsets but you had a lot of blowouts in, in the first week of competition and some schools most of them every bracket had eight or ten teams that didn't even have winning records that still made it so what's your take there well it's better than it was before when you had 13 teams and like one select and i agree coach i think you know select non-select you know I, I like what you just said traditional non-traditional schools i think that would sound better um but uh even though it's better that they they added a lot of the public schools into the select division to get a bigger bracket um you still end up with um you know Here's a school like Holy Cross is is on the outside looking in, and you got other schools you know you're much better than they are, and they were able to get in. Yeah, that's right. I, I think one of the coaches in, in the city said Warren Easton, for instance, had they been in another district, they probably would have won it, and they, sure. know, they, didn't, they didn't make the playoffs. So that was a that was a great point, Coach. You talked briefly about uh, about Blue, one of your great running backs that you've had there. Who are some of the better players that you've coached, either a Jesuit because. You know, you had Jesuit, you had Hornville, you had Shaw. Who's some of the better players that you've been associated with and, and coached on the high school level? Well, uh, probably the best was Thomas Pittman at East St. John. He was 6'5", he was 276. He was the number two recruit in the country. Um, he was offered by – he was USA Today Defensive Player of the Year. Really? Wasn't he a baseball player also? Coach, he signed with Auburn because he wanted to go play with Pete Jenkins. He was the number one draft pick of the Montreal Expos and went to baseball. <laughs> exactly. exactly. He played two years of baseball. His contract was up. He walked on at Florida and started in the Sugar Bowl. Then they signed him again. He played two more years of baseball, never made it out of double-A. They just walked on in the NFL. He played one year in NFL Europe, and then he played for the Browns and the Broncos. That's amazing. And who's some of the others, Coach, that you had? Well, obviously, people know about Leron Landry, who's number six overall pick. Um, Darius Raynard, who played uh, for the Vikings and the Titans. 
Uh, I had uh, LaRon's brother, DeWan Landry, went to Georgia Tech as a quarterback. They had, with the O'Leary situation, um, they had a change of coaches. They moved him to defensive back. He ends up playing 10 years in the National Football League. It was funny that the two safeties for the Ravens when he played were DeWan Landry and Ed Reed, Hornville and Destrahan were the two safeties for the Ravens. Um, Roy Dell Williams, I was fortunate enough to coach him uh, as an assistant. Um, Ron Sancho, four-year starter at LSU. He played in the National Football League. So I've been lucky. I've you know, good players make you a good coach, and I've had some really good players. Because someone wrote something in the paper, I think, just yesterday about the River Parishes and the number of championships that come out of the River Parishes, you know. And you've been part of that as, as a coach at Hornville, and that fan has their skins on the wall, and you will go down the river. Uh, East St. John had went back in, I think it was 19, was it 1980 or something like that. Yep. Uh, St. Charles Catholic has, 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 I think, three of them. Uh, Riverside has a has a championship. Uh, West St. John has several uh, state championship. Lutcher Natural has the most of anybody on on, on the river, and uh, might might add to that total. So it's been a pretty good run. When people talk about the River Parish football, uh, what do you think makes it a little bit different than than a lot of other places, Coach? It's uh, look. I was a Catholic League guy, and I'll tell anyone in the Catholic League. It ain't the same as the River Parishes. It's just different. You know, I remember I'm a young guy. I have my first head coaching job. I'm at East St. John. I got to go to a jamboree meeting. And I'm sitting in a meeting full of legends. You know, I'm, you know, I'm sitting in a meeting with Laurie DuPont and Mickey Roussel and Tim Dettelier. And I'm saying, man, what am I doing in here? Mm -hmm. And uh, my first game... At East St. John, we had Lutcher at home, and they called me at 2.30 in the afternoon. They said, hey, you got to open the gate. The Lutcher fans are already there, ready to. <laughs> so uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like River Parish football, uh, you know, because it's important. It's important to the community, I think, the history of the teams. And the biggest thing is there's no difference you could be a 1A, a 2A, a 3 There's no difference in the A's. You could take a 1A West St. John, can whip a 5A Destro in any day of the week. Yeah, and, you know, Louis, because of the factories that they have, there's so much intermingling with, with one another. The guys talk about it at work, at lunch break, if they work at all, you know, and that's a big thing there. They tease one another, it's a, and uh, they actually know the players. So it's a it, it actually adds a little pressure to you as a coach to say, hey, I better succeed here, but because the, you know you'll be all over Facebook or something like that. So it's it, you're right, and uh, it's been a lot of fun working all those years there, Coach. Um, uh, tell me, tell everybody about these. Remember years ago, you and I were well, you the one that actually got it together about the World Game. We were part of the Super Bowl thing. And you and I, on the coaching staff, we had to play a team from Europe. We had to play a team from Canada. And, and actually, the Japanese team, actually, we, we housed the Japanese team. And my parents, at the time at St. Charles, took some players in and, and uh, tell everyone about that story, how that thing all came about. Well, a guy named Patrick Steenberg came up with the idea. And um, the first one was when... The Packers played the Patriots in New Orleans. And he had a team of Mexican All-Stars and a team of European All-Stars. And he got Jerry Foley involved. <clears throat> and Jerry Foley called a bunch of coaches together and said, look, we need you to house these kids. So Grace King and I took some of the Mexican kids. The Catholic League guys took because Holy Cross at that time in the Ninth Ward, they had dormitories. So they were able to take a lot of the European kids. And, um, you know, and then it just kind of grew from there every year. So when it came back down to New Orleans, Steenberg called me. I said, you can play the games at Hornville. I don't care. <clears throat> and so that was the first time where the NFL really saw what was going on at junior ch uh, championships. I had to house the Canadian team. Boy, were they good. They were gigantic. Um, and, uh, you housed the Japanese team. <clears throat> but 
but that was a great experience. Uh, we ended up winning. The Canadians had won the last three before us. We ended up beating the Canadians. Yeah. Uh, but then USA football got involved and took that away from Patrick Steenberg, and they kind of messed it up. Yeah, so I read that. that was a so great they don't idea. have it anymore. Oh, that's a shame because what brought it to mind is when the Super Bowl was, it was scheduled to be here again, I thought about that. Because as you and I, you remember Vic Umont, we, we had a good yeah. coaching staff, that, that whole group, and, and uh, um, you know, Billy North, and I can remember the whole group. We practiced at your place, and we played, first of all, we played the European team that was real, real good. And then the Canadian team had a heck of a quarterback, and we, ba we barely beat them. That, that was a great week. But, you know, uh, Luke, when the Japanese team practiced at St. Charles Catholic, and the parents took, took them home, and, and some of the parents uh, took them to shopping, what do you think that what do you think the kids wanted the most? All the Japanese kids wanted and they had a lot of money in their pocket. They had cell phones that were so advanced at ours. And right now they were really advanced and all their technology was advanced and our kids were, were blown away by it. Actually, some of them sat in the class, but they were enamored with blue jeans. So when they oh, when, yeah. when they went to the mall, uh, if they can afford it, they bought like ten pair a piece of blue jeans. They were enamored with blue jeans. And I don't know if you don't get that in, in Japan. And um, but we, in fact, one guy actually stayed in touch with him for a long, long time until we lost contact. But uh, what I what, what we did notice, they were on our field from eight thirty in the morning, and they practiced till about eleven thirty. They get they fed them lunch, and a lot of times it was sushi or something like that. Fed them lunch, and they practiced again till three o'clock until our bell wow. rang. Till our bell rang, and I told my players I said, "You guys think you work hard? Look at these guys." Now, unfortunately, they didn't win any games because no. they didn't have much size. But it was tremendously big. But, 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 Coach, I, I remember that was a great experience for for all of us. And if you recall, Coach uh, Nick Saban sat in the office at one of our practices. He sat there and he watched yeah. us go, go through the routine, and then he came out to practice because wow. at that time they can actually view some of the players as prospects that we had he, on the team. I you think know, he but, stole it. He stole a kid uh, from Tulane, a receiver that he committed to Tulane, and he ended up getting him. But he also came <clears throat> to Hornville to watch the Canadian practice because they were gigantic. Exactly. And uh, they had, uh, so it was funny, uh, the black kids were the French speakers and the white kids spoke English. So the coach had to speak both English and French <laughs> when they would speak to them. Well, the, the Japanese kids, they only had one that could communicate with us. And then they had to bring the liaison over, the interpreter over, but only one kid could speak English. But coach, uh, listen, uh, before we go here, coach, uh, First of all, tell us about your family. How's your family doing? And and what's going on with your family? Well, um, I have uh, my youngest daughter is a um, pediatric cancer and blood disease doctor at Children's Hospital. Wow. And she's about, she's married to the assistant athletic director at Tulane. <laughs> and, uh, She's about she's about to go to Harvard to be trained in doing uh, bone marrow transplants on babies. Oh my God! So, yeah, I don't know how she does it, but and then my other daughter is a producer. Uh, she's nominated for a second Emmy. Uh, she's a producer at Channel Six. No kidding! My my goodness! I yeah, say, my wife did a good job. You better check that, was, gene, that gene pool. Coach, you know? coach, we were busy raising other people's kids. We couldn't raise ours. <laughs> exactly. I remember you telling me one time, your son, you watch your son throw a football, and all these years you coach off. I just said, my son don't know how to throw. <laughs> coach, coach, listen. Thank you so much for coming oh, thank on. You, Frank. I, I really enjoy this, and 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 if we could help you in any way, listen. You are always free to call and and then, and. Uh, You've had a great career, and uh, you know you're well respected in the coaching ranks, and people listen to you on the radio every Friday night. So you do a heck of a job, and if, so if we can do ever do anything for you, let us reciprocate. I appreciate it. The good thing I didn't beat people bad enough for them to dislike me, so <laughs> I did okay. So um, you know, but thank you very much. This is a lot of fun. Okay, thank you, Coach. We'll have you on again. All right, Frank. Okay. Good. That's good. Good night. We would like to thank Golf Coach Responders for being a sponsor of the Let's Be Frank video podcast.
Based out of Gramercy, Louisiana, LSR produces Southern Cane Pure Cane Sugar, which is only grown, refined, and packaged in Louisiana. LSR utilizes the latest innovations in technology, as well as ensuring the growth and stability of Louisiana sugarcane farmers by integrating more than 800 growers in the industry's economic structure. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rouse's supermarkets. Since 1972, Riverlands Insurance Services has been dedicated to securing the best insurance products and services available to protect you, your family, your assets, and your business. Our goal has been to establish a strong relationship and partnership between you, the insurance company, and our agency, creating a circle of success that prepares for disasters before they actually happen. We would like to thank Riverlands Insurance for sponsoring the Let's Be Frank video podcast. Welcome back to segment number three of the Let's Be Frank video podcast. Jason Dewey alongside me is Frank Monica. And this is our third and final segment with the, uh, the Let's Be Frank segment. Coach, but before we jump into your segment, I did want to discuss you had mentioned this World Football Championship, and I was very intrigued. And you kind of mentioned me just a few moments ago that you were the office of coordinator during this event. And I know this isn't the only time you've ever coached during this type of event. How does that change the way that you operate in offense when you are coaching a group of guys that you don't have a ton of time to coach? How much does that impact the way you call plays, the plays that you call, and maybe the style of offense that you run? Well, it, number one, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you run an offense that, that will feature the kids. In other words, you don't go in those type of games to run a wing T offense. You don't go in those type of games to run a triple option offense. You have to run something that accentuates because you pick these kids, these receivers and running backs, and you want to make sure that they handle the ball. So basically we ran a pro offense and had a little experience with that because we used to have an all-star team from River Parishes that played the the, the Terrebonne Lafourche Parishes at Nickel State. It was sponsored by the Lions Club down in Thibodeau at one time. Uh, they discontinued it, but it was it was a great experience for us and so, I mean, that in itself, so you learn from things like that. So you, you bring in the coaches, you go over the blocking scheme. Now, one thing you have in an all-star play, you do have rules about can you blitz or can you uh, can you blitz a five-man blitz or something like that. So you do have those rules. So that's in place and um, in, in, in the all-star games because you have to have something. You just can't go in there and say, well, I'm going to rush eight every play or something like that. So that was in place. And we put in a pro style of attack, which I was familiar with that it, we, we installed at Tulane when I was uh, as a coordinator at Tulane years ago. And it was very, very simple to install that. But I used my terminology and I, I let the kids do it. And since I was calling the stuff, I used my terminology, you know, we, what we called a route. And what we did, we just named the routes, which was with, 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 what they were. And if it was a curl, we called it X curl, you know, so everybody knew what it, what, what it was. They, everybody else had to learn the complement to that. They had to learn the protection. And uh, the whole numbering system, you know, is universal. Uh, I should say that because I, I worked with one coach that has a different whole number system. He blew our mind. But normally, the whole number system goes zero, two, four, six, eight to the right, uh, one, five, one, three, five, seven, nine to the left. And then you put the, the backs in there, and the, the two backs don't be tail back, the full backs don't be three back, and that tells you where he's running the ball. So if you say 24, the the two back to the tail back run into the four hole. So it's very, very simple, a process, but you don't have a lot of running plays and you have a package of pass plays that you have drop back passes and you have a little bit of play action. So you have to be, you're very limited on what you can install in a one week time. Now the practice, we only have one practice a day. If we had two a days, we could install a lot more. So, so everything was verbal. You had to do things verbal and not numerically. So you had to kind of tell them, okay, um, you know, you can run X curl, um, Z flat or something like that. So you made everything verbal. So everybody knew you, you were talking to every receiver when you talk about, or you say, why, why climb? Or you say, why flat? Why cross? We actually had a guy on our football team that, and uh, he, 
came from a he came from a Veer team and he was a tight end. And we must have thrown him in one ball game, I think, eight passes. He said, Coach, this is phenomenal. I never caught eight passes in my career. He said, I said, I got eight passes in one ball game. So we did run a, a pro set, but again, it, it's not easy to implement. You just gotta have kids to buy in, gotta have smart kids and and a lot of times you have to put it on cards and you're coaching all the way through the game. And uh, because you just can't assume that they know it. All right, coach. So let's go ahead and dive into your first, uh, your first topic under the let's be Frank segment, which is what happens after 105 scholarships? Well, guys, I think that everybody's, I don't know if everybody's aware, but the, the new judge, uh, the judge rather is going to come up with this new ruling about every school and it has not been been clarified yet, but the ruling will come shortly. It's going to come in, in, in April. Uh, about every school is going to be allowed to have 105 scholarships. Now, this will eliminate the walk-on program, but 105 scholarships. So every kid you have on your football team is going to have to be on scholarship. Now, can you violate that? That's, that, that's a little bit up there. Can you, for instance, say, I'm, I'm going to give 95 to the football and maybe the other 10 I'll give to some other sport? Uh, I don't think that would be allowed to do that. Uh, in baseball, they're going to go to 34. And uh, in basketball, is going to get their 15 like they, like they normally have. So how do you regulate the 105 scholarship? How many schools can afford 105 scholarship? I'll take Tulane, for instance. When the tuition out there and the room and board Tulane, the scholarship is worth somewhere around 85000 a year. So can Tulane afford to give 20 more scholarships? Now, not only the university that you're talking about, on top of that, you're talking about NIO stuff. You know, you, that, so there's a lot of money to be, be raised here. So well, where's the ceiling on all this? Where is it going? What happens to the Title IX? What happens to the girls' program? What I see through the little small crystal ball here, I see that a lot of smaller sports, no matter what you call them, if you call them non-revenue sports is a better way to classify them. I can see a lot of non-revenue sports, the sports that don't draw, draw and have, have ticket takers or stuff like that and draw at the gate. I can see them actually being dropped or maybe submitting themselves and it's going to end up being like the Ivy League and be need-based need based programs. Uh, is that where we're headed with this? It's going to be interesting to see exactly how, how uh, coaches don't even know how they're going to handle this. And all this is up in the air. They're going to have to sit around for a long, long time. Uh, I don't know what Title IX's position is going, is going to be. Uh, you know, in football, for instance, okay, 105 scholarship. I need to clarify this. You have 22 positions when you put the kicker in there, but people don't realize this with all the special teams, with all the special teams that you actually have 86 different positions in football. Now, this is going to, in, in the past years, I've got to say this in the 80s, we had 95. When I was at Tulane, I first started coaching at Tulane University after leaving Lecture High School, we had 95 scholarships. So you can go out and sign 95 guys. That was the total now. What people don't realize right now, you, the maximum you can sign in a year is 25, but the total is 85. You have to be down at 85 before the season starts. So it doesn't make sense. I never could figure that out. You sign 25 a year, that's 100. How do you come, come up with the 85? Well, the NCAA and their infinite wisdom said, well, attrition will hit you, so you're going to end up with 85. But now, I remember us being at 95, but Title IX came in, and they started squawking. So in order for them to get less scholarship, football was cut 10 and gave more to the, the, the Title IX programs. And so because they had nothing to compare to football, they had, you know, they had basketball that can compare girls and boys basketball, softball can compare to baseball, but the girls did not have another sport to compare to football. So football had to give up 10 scholarships. So where, getting back to the, where is it going to go? Where, the 105 scholarships, I mean, are people going to put 105 guys on scholarship and uh, it's going to hurt the junior college guys? It's going to hurt the, the walk-on program? What people don't realize with the walk-on program, you have what we get in Louisiana is called TOPS which is a tuition assistant program. So if you have that pro, that's where all your walk-ons came from. So basically those guys were going to school free anyway. They just had to pay for their room and board, but their tuition was paid for. And Louisiana still has that in place. So this is really going to, a tops kid that wants to go walk on to a program, maybe wants to be a kicker or a punter. This is, looks like that's going to eliminate him also. So the 105, I like that idea of the 105. But when you eliminate the walk-ons, I, I, I'm not too sure about that. And, and I just don't know how many schools, let's say a Vanderbilt that LSU is playing, how many schools can afford to put 105 guys on football scholarship and how many can afford to put 34? Right now, baseball is 
And then, so I don't think baseball is going to, is going to need that many, but where's the 105 scholarships, where are they going to be placed and how are you going to utilize them? Coach, you mentioned the consequences or impact of these types of decisions being made. Uh, Mississippi College announced today that they were going to drop their football program. And uh, the quote from the athletic director was, as we consider the changing landscape of college football, the increasing influence of the NIL and transfer portal, as well as increasing costs to operate and travel, we felt it was necessary to focus our efforts on building first-class programs that can compete for championships. So when you talk about the impact, again, we're seeing a local impact at the school that you sent young men to to play football and, and they're going to disband the program. And that's just nope. unfortunate. University of Minnesota has already dropped a couple of sports. One of them was swimming. So, I mean, that's, you know, it, uh, unfortunately, that's, it, you can see more of that. So you can see us going to basically to an Ivy League format in some of these schools. All right, Coach. You also, uh, we have our Blitz the Ball Coach segment where tonight you're going to talk about what is double coverage. Well, you know, I wanted to explain this, you know, and the fact that I got two good guys uh, that saw the ball game that night, Ken and Lynn Landry, you know, they, they said they watch our, our program a lot and they like it and they like this portion of it, uh, the blister ball coach. What I want to do is kind of clarify exactly. I hear commentators talk about, well, he threw into double coverage. And I, don't, I really don't know if they know what they're talking about. Just because there were two guys there does not mean it was actually double coverage. It could be that was just his, that was just his job. And just to clarify this, and, and I'll show a, a brief, brief um, a drawing of it. This is what we call, and a lot of people call this, uh, cover two, cover four. And um, years ago, i got to tell this story. Years ago, it was 1979, I think it was, and a guy from Pittsburgh Stevens came in the office when I was at Tulane, and he was talking about cover two. Well, our coaches were, were familiar with man. They were familiar with, with, uh, with some type of um, a cover three concept. Uh, they, they were familiar with the, you know, what they call top coverage and stuff like that. But he said, um, so he drew on the board a coverage and he put two guys, two corners, six or seven yards from the line of scrimmage on the wide receivers on each side. Then he put two other guys on the hashes. And now, now naturally the hashes are a little different than high school and college, but he put two guys on the hashes. And the concept was that anything thrown over 20 yards, that these two guys on the hashes would get to him. Either way, whether it's in the middle of the field or to the boundary, they would get to it. And we said, Coach, I don't know if that's right. So the secondary coach grabbed me because I was one of the younger guys on the, on, on the staff at the time. And he said, let's go out there and try it. So we got our quarterback. He happened to be an all-conference quarterback by the name of Rock Hannes. And they got a couple of receivers out there. And we tested it. We had them run vertical routes on the outside. And we would backpedal on the snap of the ball and to get to the, get to the boundary and knock the ball down. And I'll be doggone if we could not do that. And now there's some weaknesses of it, and I'll show you that. But that's what people started to call cover two. Now there's a version of it called cover four, where those corners actually bail a little bit. And I'll just kind of briefly show you that because when, when a guy throws the ball deep, the corner sometimes will sink if he's not threatened by another receiver. If he's threatened by another receiver, he stays in the flat zone. Okay, so basically what you can see, if you can make this out right here on my, on my little cheap board right there, Okay, you see the corners are six to seven yards deep, and you see that the safeties are back of the back of, on, on the hash mark. Now, I got it drawn up versus two by two receivers. The corners on the snap of the ball, if that receiver right there goes vertical, he's going to put his hands on him and kind of shuck him. Now, a lot of a lot of officials look at this and say, wait a minute, he's holding. He's not holding. He's taught to disrupt the route. And so to make sure that you give the safety a chance to get to him. So you disrupt that receiver by pushing on him and getting him out of, out of his zone and making him run wider, and they'll give that safety a chance to run to him. The safety's job is all he has to do is backpedal and get deeper than the receiver. When the ball is thrown in the air, he's got a lot of time to break on the ball, whether it's to the boundary or to the middle of the field. So when you see two guys covering a guy, that's basically the cover two or cover four. A cover two means really elaborate stuff, means too deep. A cover four means four deep, a very, very elaborate terminology there. But the, the, the beauty of this, as you see, I got some dotted squares in the middle. I see, I see a dotted square on the boundary over there. That's about 20 to 24, 22 yards deep. In the middle of the field, that's 20 to 22 yards. To the other side, it's 20 to 22 yards. That's an area that you're very vulnerable. That's where and the offensive coaches know that and defensive coaches know that. So they know that that's where the ball should be placed and the receiver can catch it and be open. So the corner's responsibility 
is to keep these guys out of that zone. All right. You say, what about the middle of the field? Well, you've probably heard people call it Tampa 2. Tampa came out with a system said they would take their middle linebacker and run with anybody running to the middle of the field. Everybody else does the same thing, but the middle linebacker runs with him. He runs with the middle of the field, whoever that receiver is running to the middle with. And that, so that area, anything thrown over that box from the 22 to 25 yard, those safeties should eat it up. Now, the only time that will not happen if those safeties get off those hashes, if they go left or right and get off the hashes, or if they chase the receiver, and that could happen, and it happens often, if they chase the receiver and the guy running through, and all of a sudden that widens that zone. So if everybody does their job, this is an excellent coverage. It's really good versus the run because you got corners up there that can support the run. Uh, one thing, I don't know if I mentioned this, the corners will only sink. They'll only sink if a, another receiver, they call it number two. Like, for instance, if the slot receiver runs to the flat, then the corners will stay in the flat. But if the slot receiver goes vertical or anywhere else, they will drop deep. And that's where you see that cover two and what people what, what actually people call double coverage. So basically, that's just a normal zone coverage. Is used a ton. There are a lot of variations of this coverage now. Uh, with people can lock on what they call two man. There's a lot of variations, and and the uh, safety can roll down. And the biggest thing in college and, and NFL, you have to realize they change coverages in in the fronts every play. And high schools might not do that as much, but some of them do. Uh, they change coverages in fronts almost every play uh, to actually disrupt uh, you know quarterbacks and stuff like that. But basically, I just wanted to clarify it because I hear the term double coverage used an awful lot and overused basically when people don't know. Now, remember, the only difference is in high school, the hashes are 17 and two-thirds yards, where in college, they're, they're, at, they're at 20. So you have to make that adjustment with your safety in high school level. All right. Thank you, Coach, for breaking that down for us. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at our At The Water Cooler segment, where tonight, Coach, you're going to discuss – Long-term contracts, for or against? Well, you know, there, there's been a lot of controversy. And uh, the word this week, you know, everybody was talking about, and I, and I hate to hear this. I I really didn't even want to read it. Well, what's the buyout clause for this guy? What's the buyout clause for this guy? And um, because of long time, you know, what people understand, you have to have long-term contracts because, one, they have to be at least, in my opinion, five years. Because when you recruit a kid, you can't go into a kid's home and say, hey, I might not be here next year. I got a five-year contract. He's got to know that he, it gives him some security. The guy that recruited me is going to be there. They want, they want that because the guy that recruited me knows my mom and dad. He knows my background. He saw me play. He knows my whole family. And he knows a lot about me personally. He's, you know, he's, he's watched all my tape. A new staff does not do that. A new staff is not going to research him like that. So he wants that security to know that guy's going to be there. Now, is 10 years too long of a contract? It could be. But you got to remember, if you have a short-term contract, other coaches will use that against you. If you have a short contract and, and stuff like that. So now I really like the fact that you have rollovers maybe, a two-year rollover. Every time you have a decent season, you have a two-year rollover or maybe a three-year rollover, and that contract rolls over and gives you a little bit more time so you're not out of there. Because if you don't have a rollover, and let's say you got a five-year contract, but you're in your fourth year, that's very easy for the administration to buy you out. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, he's not, he's going to be in great shape. You know, Bebe Orgeron, they still owe him $17 million. I mean, he's, you know, but you got to remember, they all have assistants too. And they have 10 full-time assistants on the staff and all the other personnel that you're responsible for. So you might have a, you know, have a group of about 30 different people that are tied to that head coach. So, I mean, the long contracts make, maybe in, 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 um, in, uh, in some circumstances, no. But the biggest thing is this: people need to understand every head coach now has a darn agent. And these agents, you know, they, they get whatever the percentage is. They, they actually force these guys to get these long-term contracts. Uh, University of Indiana just gave Coach Signetti a 10-year contract. Now, he's having a phenomenal year. You know, but, but what happens after this? You know, you're following half times. And remember what just happened at LSU? They had a drastic turnover, and then, and guys left the program. Some guys were, were buying, weren't buying into it. Uh, you know, they, they, they were playing hurt just to protect themselves from the draft and stuff like that. I think that so long-term contacts have a, have a place. But yet on the flip side, what is too long? Uh, Grant Taff, I, I got to say this for Grant Taff, when he was in charge of the NCAA, the coaches, when he was in charge of that, 
he tried to push for coaches, assistant coaches now, to have June-to-June -June contracts. And what that meant, it, it fell on deaf ears, what that meant that if a, a head coach got fired, what protected the assistant coach? Well, nothing did. It was the only thing he had was his contract. If he had a one-year contract, and suppose his contract expired in February. Well, if he was fired in December, he had two months to find a job. And that's awfully hard. And all these guys have families. That's awfully difficult to do. So Grant Taft pushed the issue to try to get him to June. And some schools will do that. Some schools, that, that every contract dip. Now, from that, they've got assistant coaches now. They, they have multiple-year contracts. Sometimes they give them two or three years in that contract. It kind of holds them there, protects the school just a little bit. But, you know, it's kind of funny. People don't want their coach to leave. Uh, but, but yet, on, on, on the flip side, if he's not doing well, they want him to leave. So whether you're for it against it, you know, I kind of think that a five-year contract is kind of fair for a guy and with a rollover in place because I think he might need a little bit more time. And But what's happened now with the transfer portal and what's happened at LSU, for instance, it took him a long time to rebuild that roster, and they're still not there yet from where they came from. So people have forgotten that. So give them time and give them the contract they need. And, and I know that how much is, is too much, I don't know. Uh, but um, uh, the NIL money, is uh, included in this all this all, all this fundraising that you have to do? It's it's been a it's been a tough landscape uh, to to have to solve right here now in college football. So are the big contracts the answer? I don't know, but I I would actually agree to say at least he needs at least five years. Any coach taking a job needs at least a five year program with a rollover aspect in it. Now, naturally, we all know they all have incentives like bowls and and stuff like that. Number of wins they all have incentives, and I think that's only fair. All right, Coach, thank you. And we'll go ahead and take a look at our final segment, which is going to be our locks of the week. Coach, where are you looking this week? I'm picking this for one reason, and I, and because it's a big game, and I want some interest in it. And I think they're better with people they are. The only thing, they're on the road. I'm taking Indiana in those 10 points. I like that pick. I think Indiana really could shock some people this weekend. And, look, I mean, we know Ohio State's been there, but – Indiana's done a heck of a job this season. I, I love that pick. However, I think I'm going to steal one of your favorite picks. Look, Colorado minus two and a half. It is on the road against Kansas. They're mm. eight and two against the spread this year. I really like that game and that matchup. And Colorado for a team that was uh, sub 500, a lot of noise, a lot of talk around that team, has really done a phenomenal job this year, beating the teams that they're supposed to beat and maybe winning a few that they – maybe shouldn't have won. So I, I'm think, I think I think they'll be one of the favorite picks and you know, people want to see them in the playoffs and because they got two possible Heisman Trophy guys. Uh, Deion Sanders now mentioned for the Cowboys job. So there's a lot of interest there with uh, with that with that game. All right, Coach, uh, that'll do it for this episode. That's another week in the books. So let's go ahead and give you guys our social medias before we get out of here. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook at the Let's Be Frank video podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the LBF Podcast. Any final thoughts before we get out of here, Coach? Final thoughts, guys. I'd like to see everybody go to, uh, do a service of their choice on Sundays, and, and let's pray for our country. Uh, our guest speaker next week is former Saints player, former All-State player at Dexter Hand High School, former Nickel State uh, All-Conference player, Rusty Rebo. All right, so that'll do it for us. So for the crew at BSN, for head coach Frank Monica, I am Jason Duet, and remember, Let's lay ball on Tom Roulet. Let the good times roll.